Let us pray. God, we ask your spirit to be with us, to pry open our hearts and minds so we can receive what you have to give to us today. In these scriptures, songs we sing, words that are said, help us to know your need for who we are, your desire for who we can become. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe we have a lot more knowledge than we think we do. There's a lot more in there than you realize. More stories, more phrases packed deep inside our memories that we never dreamed were there. So I'm going to test that theory today. I'm going to start a sentence of a well-known story, and I want you to see if you can finish it. Permission to speak out loud. You ready? Here we go. Jack and Jill went up the hill. Jack fell down. And Jill, everybody knows that. There's more in there than you think. And a hundred years after Jesus' time, when the Gospel of John was written, everybody who first heard this Gospel that was read this morning about Jesus and the woman at the well had this story in their heads. Not Jack and Jill, Jacob and Rachel. Jacob came upon this well in the middle of a field, and, and since we have faucets in our house, we have a hard time understanding what a well meant to the people who first heard this story. A well was a lifeline. You can live without food for a while, you can't live without water except for maybe a day or so. And to the people of the Middle East at that time, wells were also social places. And there were also unwritten rules that everybody knew. Everybody just had these rules in our heads, like we modern America have learned when we're in grade school, you get in line at the water fountain. We've learned to keep our hands to ourselves, to wait your turn, to not take too long, to not spit back in the flowing water. I think that's a guy thing. So everybody knew the story. At that time, Jacob came upon a well, and there were already three flocks of sheep gathered there, and Jacob was chatting with the other shepherds when Rachel came up with her sheep. And Jacob tells the shepherds they should remove the stone over the top of the well so Rachel can water her sheep. The stone was two or three men heavy. It took two or three men to move that stone. But the other shepherds refused because everybody knows you don't remove the stone until all the flocks have arrived. Then everybody takes their turn according to who got there first. Kind of like the line, first grade water fountain. But Jacob goes to the well moves the stone off by himself so Rachel's sheep can drink now, no waiting. For the one who can remove the stone from the well, the water is available now. So John Shea, Catholic theologian, says that the woman at the well in this story about the opening of the well of eternal life, this is about not waiting says that the woman at the well story is about the opening of that well. So there's no need to wait to the end of time when all the flocks will gather together. The one who is living water provides divine life now. The time of waiting is over. No standing in line, no more waiting your turn. It's like if you gave a bottle of water to every kid in that line at the water fountain in the first grade, there's no more need to stand in line. No more pushing, no more shoving, no more who's first, no more pecking order, no more survival of the fittest. Everybody gets the water they need right now. So those who first heard this story just knew in their heads, Jesus was saying there's no more waiting. Eternal life is available now, not just when we die. 
So tell me, how many shepherds were already at the well when Jacob got there? Three. Good answer. You go to the water line first. And whose sheep did Jacob want to water first? The girl, Rachel. See, wells in Jesus' time were also meeting places. Roads would converge at wells. There were crossroads, major intersections, like rest stops. So Jacob's well was like the York Interchange, I-80, 81. Or like Mount Vernon, Illinois, where two major interstates, north and south, east and west, cross right there. And everybody knew the wells at Jesus' time. Like we know the gathering places around here in Grand Island, Nebraska, in the morning for coffee. McDonald's, Pam's Pub and Grub, Lee's, the Palace. Who am I missing? Burger King. And water had to be shared. The well at Sychar is still there today. Pastor Dell read the scripture in the first service. He said he had been there and drunk that water. You have to climb downstairs to see it, but it's also known that it is a well over a flowing stream, moving water. At Jesus' time, it was called water that was alive, living water. You may remember that Mercedes-Benz TV commercial a while back, Super Bowl Sunday has a car colliding against a concrete wall during a safety test, and somebody asked the Mercedes engineer why their company does not enforce their patent on their car's energy-absorbing car body. And the Mercedes dyne design has been copied by almost every car maker in the world in spite of the fact they have an exclusive patent. So an engineer replies in a clipped German accent, because in life, some things are just too important not to share. There you go. What a great statement. Some things are just too important not to share. As Christians, we believe the good news of Jesus Christ is one of those things that's too important not to share. We believe it must be shared with our friends, our neighbors, the world, and the work of sharing the news of Jesus Christ we call evangelism. Christian faith has been advanced throughout the ages. Somebody must have shared it with whoever shared it with us or we wouldn't be here. That's our responsibility to spread that good news. And in this story, back then and today, Jesus initiates the relationship. He offers the gift of living water that will bring eternal life to all who accept it and drink. See, we in the 21st century, we already know our bodies are 98% water. We know we need to drink six to eight, eight ounce glasses of water each day to keep our bodies optimally hydrated, healthy and fit. We know despite all the trendy pull top and boarded glacial steam distilled pure filter waters that we have in our grocery store, most Americans go around in a constant state of dehydration. Because of our massive consumption of alcohol, tobacco, caffeinated and sugared drinks, along with the enormous quantities of salted and processed foods, that all sucks the moisture right out of our brains, our bones, our eyeballs, and we are standing up to our hips in soft drink cans and dying of thirst. But the cells of our bodies aren't the only things that are parched because even more dry is the state of our souls. Instead of pouring in living water to cure our dehydration, we grasp for a huge deluge of spiritual junk food that's out there. Pursuing the spirituality section at the, drug, drug, at the bookstore is like going down the supermarket where you have soft drinks on one side and potato chips on the other. Some of those spiritual selections won't hurt you in small doses, doses but they taste pretty good going down. They may even give you ten, temporary sense of satisfaction. Just as biologically there is no substitute for pure life-giving water, so spiritually there is no substitute 
for the soul-filling, thirst-quenching love offered by Jesus. The kind of love that's just given. Nothing expected in return. Living love. Living water satisfies, completely satisfies, forever satisfies everyone. And in the gospel lesson today, Jesus offers the ultimate soul-saturating drink, a living, vital relationship with God. And there are rules that apply to its consumption. In fact, everything we need to know about filling our souls, we learn from Jesus at the well. Rule number one, you can lead a horse to water, but can't make it drink. Each and every one of us has to decide for ourselves whether to drink or not. Some will never touch their lips to the living water. Some will drain the whole cup, whole hog. Others will strain at gnats while swallowing camels. All we can do is offer the pure living water that quenches your soul so you will never be thirsty again. And the water here is a metaphor for total acceptance, total love, total forgiveness. And God invites us to drink this in. Reverend James Moore is one of my favorite Christian writers. He's a pastor, was a pastor of St. Luke's United Methodist Church in Houston. He tells a story about one of his minister friends, takes time each month to go down to the homeless shelter in a city and work at the soup kitchen. And after the homeless people have been fed, he invites him to join him in a service of Holy Communion. And a lot of them go into the little chapel there at the homeless shelter and join in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. They have shared soup, then they share bread and the cup together at the altar. One day this pastor had an unforgettable experience at the communion service. He was moving down the altar serving communion. He came to a man kneeling there who looked like he had been on the streets for a long time. And as he got to him, the man looked up at the pastor and whispered, skip me. What? said the pastor, pardon me. In a louder whisper, the man again said, skip me me. The pastor said, why? He said, because I'm not worthy. The pastor said, neither am I. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to serve everybody else up this line. Then I'm going to come back and serve communion to you. Then I would like you to serve it to me. The man blinked and said, father, is that legal? Yes, it's legal, it's beautiful, and that's what we're going to do. So he went up and down the altar, served all the other people kneeling there. He came back to the reluctant man and said, what's your name? He said, Josh. And the pastor placed the elements of the Lord's Supper before him and said, Josh, this is the body of Christ. Here's the blood of Christ given for you. Eat, drink, in remembrance that Christ came for you. Christ died for you. Amen. Josh blinked back the tears in his eyes, received the Holy Communion. Then the pastor knelt and handed him the trays of bread and wine and said, Now you serve me. And he looked nervously, Josh did, at the trays and said, Father, are you sure this is legal? Yes, it's legal. Just do it. And Josh's eyes were darting from side to side as he looked over one shoulder and then the other as if he expected the police or the FBI or the CIA or the Pope to come rushing in and arrest him at any moment. And finally, he held the trays toward the pastor. The pastor received the sacrament. Josh muttered, body, blood for you. Hang in there. The pastor said later, of all the communion rituals I've ever heard of, I don't ever hear, recall hearing the words hang in there in any of them. But for me, that was one of the holiest communions I've ever been a part of. And Josh walked out of that homeless shelter that day with an extra spring in his step. It was reported he went around to everyone saying, you won't believe what I did today. In fact, the story spread so widespread on the streets, he became known as the Rev from that time on. A story of grace, love, acceptance, reconciliation, holy communion. It reminds me of this gospel lesson, John chapter 4. Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. Because see, deep down inside, I think we know this stuff. 
God just needs to nudge us every once in a while and remind us. So finish this sentence for me. For God so loved the world that whoever believes in him may not perish but have what? Living water. That goes on forever. Eternal life. Amen.